This is Toledo Symphony Lab, a behind-the-scenes look at the world of classical music from WGTE Public Media and your Toledo Symphony. I'm Brad Cresswell. Joining me today are the Toledo Symphony's president and CEO, Zach Vassar, principal second violin and artistic administrator, Merwin Sue, and the TSO's marketing director, Felicia Canny. Well, the concert that inspired our program today and last week's program, we should mention, is coming up this weekend, May 11th and 12th at 8 o'clock p.m. at the Peristyle. It's music of Leonard Bernstein and Gustav Mahler. You can find more information at ToledoSymphony.com or 419-246-8000. Now, we spent the entire episode last week on Bernstein and the Serenade, which is starring our own Merwin Sue sitting right here. You told us all about your uh, experience with Serenade. We're looking forward to that. We also had a little Play-Doh quiz, and a little bit later today, we're going to have a Mahler quiz. This is kind of a revenge quiz because <laughs> it's it's coming from Zach Vassar, who has put it together for us today. Should we mention, Zach, that um, you walked in here and left the, the quiz at home? And, I did. And you... You've, you've been furiously recreating it. It will be wonderful. Us. Yeah. Well, th- of that I have no doubt. So also on the program, Mahler Symphony Number no. 1, the Titan Symphony. We're going to talk all about Mahler because... There goes one question. Zach is our... <laughs> 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 Zach, is, uh, Zach is our resident Mahler expert, as we know. Um, but I want to talk also about the other piece on the program that we haven't talked about at all yet because it's, it's a fun little story behind it. And that is uh, Mendelssohn's overture that he wrote, inspired by Victor Hugo's play Reblas, the Reblas overture. D- does anybody know the story behind this? I don't. Well, I think that Mendelssohn never called it the Reblas overture. Yeah, he didn't like the he didn't play, like the at, play all. at all. So, yeah. um, in something that I really feel it should have caught on, I don't understand why we don't call it this. Uh, Mendelssohn preferred to call it the theatrical pension fund. Overture. Yeah, and there's a story there. I really, really love that title. <laughs> I, I wish that we were beginning the concert with the Theatrical Pension Fund Overture. I think there would be a good marketing out of that, right? Did he write no. it? <laughs> did he write it for a theatrical pension? He uh, did. He did. He, Fundraiser? He was, yeah. Now, this is a thing that many people don't realize. A lot of these great composers, they were also involved in writing music for benefits. I mean, more often than not, it was a benefit for themselves. But occasionally, they would do, <laughs> they would do you know, a, a piece of music for a specific benefit that they felt was a worthy cause. And mm-hmm. in the case of Mendelssohn, he was approached by this theatrical society, what have you, and they said, could you do an overture and um, a piece of music for us, a song for this production we're doing of Victor Hugo's Mm -hmm. Reblas? And um, he went and checked out the play and did not like it, but he did write them a song. He didn't write them an overture. And what happened is they came back and they were like, oh, thank you, thank you for the song. Oh, it's just too bad you didn't have time to create an overture for us. And he took that as a challenge. So then he went back and quickly dashed off this overture, which they rehearsed, I think, maybe four or five times uh, before they actually premiered it with the play. But as you say, Merwin, then he never called it the Reblas Overture Mm -hmm. after that. Probably because it's such a hard name to pronounce. I mean, we spent like five (laughs) minutes before we went on air trying to figure out how to pronounce Reblas. It's R-U-Y. B L A S. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it could be done. You, you could try to say Rui, Rui, Rui Blaze if you wanted to. Yeah. I, I've tried many different things. <laughs> uh, but uh, see, the podcast living up to its name, a behind the scenes look Absolutely. at classical music. C- can I ask you a serious question? I mean, yeah. we just caught a glimpse of this, but, but if in a moment of panic, you as a public radio celebrity, where do you go to learn a pronunciation of a particular person's name? I well, if I don't have somebody who actually speaks that language, you know, on tap, mm-hmm. then I will go to websites that I trust. There, uh, Forvo, for instance, mm-hmm. is sort of like second best because you get native speakers who are uploading their pronunciations. That's where I got Reblas with the S pronounced mm-hmm. at the end. And after that, you know, you just make it up. And, but the, the trick is... <laughs> or avoid the word altogether. Or, or avoid yes. the word altogether, yes. Mendelssohn's Theatrical Pension Fund over to <laughs> <laughs> Like if I look at... <laughs> I'm going to write that down because we can do that now. Um, if, if I see, like, a conductor's name that I'm not sure of or an orchestra, mm-hmm. but I know the music, I'll say, hey, that was Mendelssohn. 
you know, and move on, <laughs> right? Or that guy. Courtesy of the London Philharmonic, yeah. but you won't say who was conducting. So, number one, better safe than sorry. Number sure. two, if you're going to be sorry, just go all in and, and <laughs> make whatever pronunciation you feel is right, but make it sound authentic. Convincing, yes. Okay, yeah. Now I've just lost, like, three-fourths of my audience. <laughs> Now so two listeners? The, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I started with two. You have, yeah. fr- you have fractional <laughs> listeners? <laughs> no. Oh, well. But I think one of the things that uh, when we were kind of looking at the program more in retrospect than in actual design was just realizing we talk about how Mendelssohn really could have claimed being extremely busy because all of the composers on this program were extraordinarily well-renowned conductors and were extraordinarily mm. busy as conductors. And People talk about Mahler having been the first workaholic um, conductor composer, but Mendelssohn really fills the bill just as sure. well. And, and he just didn't live as long as yes. some of these other composers. Exactly. Conductors. So, yeah. They often say that Mahler was, music wasn't really appreciated until long after he died, mm-hmm. and you could make the same argument about under Bernstein. Um, was that true about about Mendelssohn? I think that Mendelssohn's re- reception, a lot of the pieces, they were very unevenly received. I think that his, some of his works were considered overly conservative by um, some of the more kind of progressive composers. I mean, it's it's amazing to hear a uh, Mendelssohn symphony and a Berlioz symphony and think that they're contemporaneous. Um, yeah. But I think that he was still... a uh, very influential figure, and so he his works always got heard and always got probably extremely good performances. Well, and and he was also a bit of an impresario, and and the role that he played, his legacy of uh, revitalizing the music of Johann Sebastian Bach mm-hmm. and bringing that back to the public through his performance of Saint Matthew Passion was around eighteen thirty mm-hmm. something like that. Same time as the Symphony Fantastique, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so he, he not only, I think, um, left behind a legacy of his music, but he obviously elevated the reputation of Bach and opened up that door to many people. But he also fought and struggled against a lot of things, including anti-Semitism. Absolutely. Which was something that was very much alive in those days. Well, I think it's it's must be rare for a composer to have every single one of their works, you know, uh, loved by the audiences because I think Mahler's first symphony was not well received yeah. by um, the public when it premiered, and he didn't he spend like decades or a decade revising it. Yeah, yeah. much to his, his surprise. future wife hated it. Oh, really? <laughs> well, yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> it it really went until his eighth symphony before he had a critical success. So yeah. imagine being a conductor that everybody says is one of the best, if not the best, working today, and then composing and you can imagine that you have the concerts that don't have your music on the program and they sell well Mm -hmm. and the concerts that do have your music on the program don't sell very well and uh, you have to go all the way until your 8th symphony which was the last one that he actually conducted the premiere of before Mm -hmm. a success. Well 8th times the charm I think. (laughs) times the charm. It's a lucky number. (laughs) Absolutely. He didn't (laughs) didn't give up very easily (laughs) obviously. He kept going yeah. But we should mention also the tie-in, and I assume that this was part of the, the programming initiative uh, between Bernstein as a conductor and Mahler as a composer. Do mm-hmm. you want to talk about that? Well, absolutely. I think that, um, in a way, Bernstein probably had a very um, direct entree into Mahler's world, both of them extremely successful mm-hmm. conductors who also fought anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. And Bernstein recorded multiple sets of Mahler. I happen to prefer his early recordings. Um, but they're just... I mean, Bernstein was Is maybe in the same way that Mendelssohn um, kind of really launched Bach. I don't think Mahler was ever completely forgotten, but certainly he was a much more important figure in the symphonic literature after Leonard mm-hmm. Bernstein than before. Yeah. Because Leonard Bernstein was a big fan of Mahler, absolutely, and that was yeah, the and a big. Pro- he was one of the only conductors that was really picking up Mahler and running with it. Right. You know, back in the well, in they were time. very heavy scores. <laughs> <laughs> That's what <laughs> he I was hear. In good shape. Well, it was it was the fifties and sixties. He was really. Um, you know, Bernstein would often say that he's the one who should be credited for reviving Mahler's reputation. And funny enough, Mahler made some statement to, I think it was Bruno Walter, that, um, you know, would that it were that I could be 
appreciated for my uh, symphonic premieres 50 years after my death. So <laughs> let's just put this stuff in a box, folks, and yeah. play it in 50 years Time because I don't want to have to deal with it anymore. Uh, and that's kind of what, what Bernstein did. 50 years after Mahler's death, he started this great series and cycle in New York uh, with New York Philharmonic. Um, and and it was it was really that plus the work of some other conductors who really kind of made Mahler's music great. I mean, uh, Bruno Walter himself worked very hard. He was the first president of the Mahler Society um, yeah. to keep the, the name alive and, and mm-hmm. to keep the, the music in the concert halls. I, I think it also helped that Bernstein was with the New York Philharmonic, and he had that legacy there, yeah. Mahler being a former music, music director, director of the New York Philharmonic. Yeah. There goes another question. That yes. gave him a little... <laughs> They gave Bernstein. Get it all out. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna get this quiz out of the way. <laughs> yes. Without even doing it. <laughs> um, High five, Brad. <laughs> excellent. Oh, one thing that and now I think I mentioned before. I'm not really that well versed in Mahler, but when I have have listened to Mahler, you tend to develop a sense of his symphonies as being really heavyweight and mm-hmm. really deep and difficult to you know wrap your ear around. But when you listen to a lot of Mahler, there's a lot of it that's very light, very mm-hmm. lyrical, very catchy, mm-hmm. very fun. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of course, yeah, there are these great big moments, but I was struck by the lyrical mm-hmm. side of Mahler. And, and do we have that in this symphony, in this first symphony? I would say so. I mean, there's there's a lot in this that um, that dances, that has some of the, the lyricism that you're speaking of. Um, there There is a sense that um, c- conductors love conducting Mahler because there's a lot for them to interpret and ways to put their stamps on the music. Um, but I think the best Mahler conductors don't get in the way of the music. You know, they take it as lightly as possible and let the music mm. do what it's supposed to do because this is one of those things that if it is overwrought, it turns into what you just described, this very heavy, scary, menacing obstacle. Um, but if you let the music do what it's supposed to do, it, it is on its own amazing and terrifying devastating at points and exhilarating and you know Mahler took great pains to to indicate to the musicians how he wanted his music to be played yeah. you know cues to the clarinets and horns exactly how to hold their instruments at various points in the music to achieve a specific sound and in, into the audience mm-hmm. um so you have these clarinetists playing you know Benny Goodman style up in the air and um uh, and and that's exactly the sort of theatricality that he was adding to it. But it also means that he knew what he wanted. We don't have to imagine what he was trying to achieve. Yeah, it, it sounds like his experience as a conductor had a big influence on his mm-hmm. composing. True, as well. True. Yeah. Well, how you doing, Zach? You feel yeah. like you got your quiz? Let's do it in good shape here. Uh, let me turn up some music for you. Okay, a little. Uh, oh gosh, this is actually soundboard over. It's amazing. <laughs> this is this is. This is a, a Mahler a, piece. A, you wouldn't have known. <laughs> I you, told you it could be light and frothy at times. <laughs> but this, no, this is the uh, second movement. No, I'm kidding. This <laughs> is Mahler's composition. Uh, it's simply called The Game Show. I have turned over the soundboard to Zach Vasser. So he is in control now of all the special effects. You've given that we're him too hear. much power. Well, <laughs> you know, we've only got a few episodes left this season. That's so. just about absolute power corrupting. <laughs> yeah. <There's, laughs> This is what we call jumping the shark. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna. Well, you know, it's interesting, Brad. I've spent the entire season looking at the backside of the soundboard, and, and to look at it now and look at it in the face, I realize that it's just a soundboard. It's yeah. like a bingo yeah. chart. But it's <laughs> yeah, I think you got bingo over here. It's a lot bingo. harder than it seems. I mean, you, you know, you have to sort of know where to put your finger, right? <laughs> it's like playing the violin, right, Merwin? It's exactly he just like guesses playing too. the violin. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. Yeah, you have frets. <laughs> This is Zach's revenge to, quiz. I, well, you know, these are really meant to provoke discussion more than achieve revenge. Um, and we can talk about revenge. Yeah, and and <laughs> and I think, <laughs> and I think we, if I separate these, I have a couple questions about Mahler the man, Mahler the composer, and Mahler the conductor. So uh, those are not necessarily the order they'll be read in. Um, but let's start with something uh, very simple, which is what movement of the first symphony was removed famously. Oh, you the, the Blumina movement, second I know that movement, there, were right? five, five there were five movements at one point, and then he edited it out, and it became the four that we know today. That's right. And the second and third were, well, typically the second movement's like the slow, 
this mm-hmm. kind yeah. of movement. Mm-hmm. The but in this one, it's the, like a lilt. It's like a, isn't it three, four or something? But which like one that? was removed? Are we supposed to raise our hands? Or no, no, I think you, you which I one's just removed? Blumina, uh, Blumina, Blumina was <laughs> correct. We all yeah. got it. So, Blumina was correct. So, Blumina was a previous existing theme, and he, he used a lot of other themes when he was writing most of his symphonies. He would, he would basically steal from other things that he had written, usually songs. But the Blumina movement was a, a kind of an early love song about falling in love with a woman, and and uh, he had had thrown it into the first symphony, and then Hokey Pokey, he took it out, and um, oh my gosh! And uh, I just some now I have a vision of Mahler doing the Hokey Pokey in my head. It's actually really funny because that would have been difficult for <laughs> yeah. him. Yeah, I'm expecting a, a a little cheer there from the crowd for. Right? Sorry, let, let's See? do that again. Wait, why? He's trying to figure out the soundboard. Well, it, it, I told you it's harder than it than. No, no, no wrong no. one. <laughs> that, wow, they go, the you one. can play two at the same time. Oh, yeah. really? Definitely wow. the hokey pokey is not on the soundboard, but Mahler actually had kind of a a nervous walk that some people actually describe as a nervous twitch in one of his legs. And I think and they say oh. that he actually inherited that from his mother. Now you're so, telling me that the hokey pokey <laughs> It would, you it think would have been a challenge. Well, yes, for him Mahler. to put his right Poor foot Mahler. in and then put his right foot out might have been a twitchy, Gosh. twitchy d- d- difficulty you for him. You are going to Mahler hell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Mahler hell. We're doing a quiz on Mahler with Zach. <laughs> doing no, we the quiz. Fun of We're him. in Mahler have, hell right and, now. And, you, and you've been rehearsing <laughs> this for how long? I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, okay, folks, let's try to uh, bring this okay. back here because I really didn't expect to go to the Mahler hokey pokey on that one. Um, <laughs> you okay. said provoke, the question. <laughs> provoke discussion. <laughs> here we okay. are. So uh, one of the reasons that the first symphony achieved such critical disdain is the uh, the handling of the opening of the third movement in which he rearranges a popular children's tune to almost funeral dirge effect. So what was the uh, the popular tune that... <gasps> I know, I know. Okay, go ahead, Okay, Felicia. Felicia. Is it Frere Jacques? It is Frere Jacques. Or are you sleeping or... Yeah. That's right. And I think there's even a German version of it that... Where's... Bruder Heinrich or Bruder (laughs) Johann. Exactly. And I think right now Zach is going to play it on his kazoo. Oh, yes. (laughs) Oh, he forgot it. (laughs) Oh, well. What I would love to do, if we can splice it in later, is to just play the opening of the fourth, the The third third movement. movement. Why can't we sing it? It has to be in minor, right? <laughs> well, ex- so Wait, you guys got to roll your. <laughs> well, you you did a reasonable job there because what he he, he makes it minor keyed, so he he takes that that half step down. <laughs> it's beautiful. I love Those it. Those kids, let's do it in a round. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no? What a depressing round. That's um, all right. We'll get around to it. Uh, <laughs> but you can imagine See, sitting now, through. See, if you really knew how to use that oh. soundboard, you would have you would have chimed in right Yay! there. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm, yes, we always one, cheer one, puns one. on this show. <laughs> Um, how come my puns get crickets and his around pun gets a he cheer? He has the power. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There we go. Oh, okay. I was ready for that one. Uh, but you can imagine sitting there in the the premiere and the third movement comes out as a slow movement, first of all, but a funeral dirge and taking a children's tune and yeah. making it this very eerie, awkward thing. And this is what a lot of the first audiences... It's creepy. Yeah, and it's still <laughs> creepy to listen to. If you've never heard a note of Mahler and you come into this performance, you're going to listen yeah. to it and you're say... Like, what is he trying are, to say? Why are they doing this? And then after that, it, he incorporates a lot of klezmer music, and it. Um, you can imagine that original uh, audience in, in Budapest wondering what the heck they're listening to, mm-hmm. because this yeah. is not the territory of classical music up to that point. Now that we've had the funeral dirge, let's celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about <laughs> Mahler the man um, for a second here. So uh, Mahler was a, was a pronounced vegetarian in an oh. era that vegetarianism hadn't quite caught on. Uh, but as any good Viennese, he loved his sweets. So what was Mahler's favorite dessert? Was it glazed donuts? I'm glad we have a multiple choice. Go ahead. Strudel, apricot dumplings, or raspberry tort. I'm going to go for apricot. I, that apricot sounds that dumplings. sounds hard to make up. I'm going to go with the a apricot tort. dumpling as well. <laughs> it was the apricot dumplings. Yeah, yeah. We should make Yay! those. 
Yay! Yay! <laughs> yeah, we should make apricot dumpling. So his his sister Justine made the best apricot dumplings, and uh, he would often chastise his friends uh, for for not appreciating them as much as he did. Oh. Wow! All right. So the Sounds next like question. Sounds like quite a guy. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Seriously, here, this is going to show you a little of the tragedy in his life. So uh, Mahler's wife, Alma Mahler. Uh, she was known for her promiscuity and for being the great uh, beauty of of, uh, of civilization at that time. Uh, with whom was she known to have had a love affair? Uh, a. Walter Gropius. B. Alexander von L- Zemlinsky. C. Franz Werfel. Or D. All of the above. I'm going to say D. D. I might. I actually knew about the uh, Walter Gropius <laughs> one because there was rumor that Manon Gropius, who was the inspirer of the Berg Violin Concerto, was actually was there. Yeah, yeah. so it's it is D. She yeah. she was she was in bed with all three of these men at the same time. Oh, oh gosh. Okay. at it. This is a family friendly <laughs> podcast. <laughs> family friendly. You're gonna have so much fun editing this. <laughs> yeah, I always do. <laughs> So earlier we we, uh, we learned that uh, Mahler was the conductor of the New York Philharmonic. What other great American arts institution was Mahler also the director of? Oh, it has to be in New York. Yeah, it has to be another New York. Was it was the it? Met? Uh, Lincoln oh, Center? Yes. It was yeah. the Met. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he was an opera conductor. He was an opera conductor. In fact, he started at the Met before he went to the Philharmonic. And in his last year at the Met the Met had to divide his season between Mahler and another conductor. Who was that second conductor who took over from Mahler at the Met? Mm, no multiple choice. Wait, can you, like, give years? Was it Bruno? 1908, 1910, something in there. I'm going to pass on this one. I don't know. It was Arturo Toscanini. Oh, I knew there oh, was wow. an Arthur in there somewhere. <laughs> Arturo. So Toscanini takes over the Met, and then uh, Mahler moves to the Philharmonic, and then later after after Mahler dies, Arturo Toscanini takes over the Philharmonic as well. So wow. both of these men were able to conduct both of those orchestras at the yeah. same time, which is a, a great feat to think you about. You managed to stump us. Yeah, Standing so on the footsteps of giants. Yeah, shoulders <laughs> of giants. Okay, so as an opera conductor... Um, Mahler did uh, a lot of uh, uh, premieres in Germany and then American premieres of famous operas as well. Um, And it was a famous performance of Tristan that blew away a young composer at the time and and fundamentally changed his view of music. Uh, Was that composer uh, Eric Korngold, Arnold Schoenberg, Jean Sibelius, or Rayfon Williams? I'm going to say it was Sibelius. I'm going to try Schoenberg. I know that they had a very, very close relationship. Mahler and Schoenberg did. Mm. Who do what you were the other t- two choices? <laughs> <laughs> you have, I paid uh, attention. Korngold, <laughs> Schoenberg, Sibelius, or Von Williams? Von Williams. It was Von Williams. Good Whoa. job. Yay! And Felicia pulls ahead. <laughs> yeah, You're so in the he, lead. He would do these things where... Um, where he would he would play Wagner and he would go to different areas. So he actually uh, did a trip to London, his one and only trip to London that mm-hmm. uh, that allowed him to really dazzle a new audience with this Germanic repertoire. It influenced Von Williams. He's like, I'm never writing music like that. <laughs> <laughs> What not to do? No, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Exactly. I think Von Williams later on went to say that Mahler was a, um, a figment of a composer or something like that. So yeah. the, the the love affair was short lived. Oh, yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Well, then he went and studied with Ravel mm-hmm. and uh, wrote music that was nothing like Ravel. You know, that, that was sort of his thing. He wanted to rival Ravel. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, well, last official question: uh, Where did Mahler conduct his final concert? Was it the Musikverein in Vienna, the Konzertgebouw in Amsterdam, Albert Hall in London, or Carnegie Hall in New York? Carnegie Hall? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah? That's right. It was Because he died Hall. in New yes. York. He yeah. Oh, he died in Germany? Or he was he buried died. in Germany, but he yeah. died in New York. I thought yeah. he, like, flew back, like, just in the nick of time. I think we need to take that back. Then. <laughs> Did they? Wait, what year is this? 1910. 1911? 1910. Yeah, 1910. Huh. Yeah. When did planes... I don't know. 1911. <laughs> Are you serious? No, I can't remember. He flew. He didn't say he took a plane. That's right. <laughs> oh, my. He found a he passenger He had his angel's pigeon. wings and flew <laughs> over. Aww. Aww. Anyway, nice job, Felicia. I, this is what happens when I study at midnight 
Yeah. I, I'm like a night owl. I retain everything. I think I you won last it. week, too. You were like the quiz champion now. Can can I end with a question that's not really a question, but I want to have this as a dialogue as we talk about Mahler. Sure. How many symphonies did Mahler write? There are many ways to answer this, and, and well, I just love to I mean, chat about that. I guess you could say maybe nine, maybe ten. I'd say At least eight. ten and a half. <laughs> I'd say probably ten and a half. Uh, so five. for those who are listening, let's talk about why this isn't an easy answer. Like so, Beethoven, nine symphonies, easy. How many did Mahler write? Well, Das Lied von der Erde. Von der Erde. Von der Erde. Erde. Sorry. The Song of the Earth. The yeah. Song of the Earth. Um, just, I think that's this sort of weird song cycle mashed into a symphony, but to me it feels very symphonic. And the one piece that I really would love to get on a season. Just Oh, yeah, absolutely. You should so, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so he was afraid of writing a Ninth Symphony because of the Curse of the Ninth. Uh, you know, Bruckner wrote oh, Nine, right. uh, Schubert wrote Nine, Beethoven wrote Nine, so he didn't want to write a Ninth Symphony. So what would have been his Ninth Symphony, he called Das Lied van der Erde. And, uh, and then... He wrote a Ninth Symphony, and guess what? He died. Died. Well, yeah. he started a Tenth Symphony. <laughs> he started a Tenth He yeah. tried really hard There's to a, break the, his curse. What, the other Jethro movement? Oh, no, that, that's Dante. from the Fifth Symphony. That's from, okay, yeah. I'll cut that out. Yeah. He should have written two at the same time at the end. So. That's right, so you wouldn't know which Eight one was which. Eight jumped to ten. Yeah. That's right. Well, so yeah, so there's a um, an adagio from the Tenth and it, and it is complete, and it sounds just like Mahler. But then others, uh, Derek Cook most famously, have gone on to take the sketches that he left for the Tenth and finish it. So how did you become such a Mahler fan, Zach? Uh, it's a good question. So yeah, Give us your experience. Um, okay, so the, the short story is, um, no, the, the medium-length story is that my, <laughs> oh, my parents had an enormous record collection, and it inspired my interest in classical music. They had classical music, they had folk, they had bluegrass, they had Broadway, they had all sorts of different things in there, but they had a lot of classical music. And um, my dad's only word of wisdom was, you know, listen to anything you want except maybe these... LPs right here, and those are the Mahler LPs. So that was the Forbidden Fruit. Oh, that's you right. said, "Don't listen to those." Don't, Don't listen to, the to West those. Wing. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> do you think he really wanted you to listen? to Well, them, I, it, it's funny because, of course, like you know, I would sneak a couple to my bedroom and I'd listen to them, and and I'd say, "This is strange." <laughs> I put on the middle of the Second Symphony and not understand what the heck I was listening to. So it was when I was in high school that uh, English teacher friend of mine, Tom Harms. Uh, at that point was the head of the yearbook at St. John's and I was on the yearbook staff and he saw that the Toledo Symphony was performing Mahler's Third which was always his favorite Mahler Symphony. Good choice. Yeah. So he said, let's go, we gotta go. So I finally get to see Mahler and I remember exactly where I was sitting in the peristyle and I just remembered that by the end of the Third Symphony of these huge... Um, drum beats. I just had tears down my face, and I was looking up. Yeah, like those. Like actually, those. yes, D's and A's, exactly. Yeah. But a little <laughs> slower. A lot slower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember having to look up at the ceiling of the peristyle just to because I couldn't process anymore. Like I had to take at least the sight away so I my emotions could try to catch up because they were just on hyperdrive. And you know they talk about life changing moments, and that was one for me. Wow. So I loved Mahler ever since. Just made me feel music in a different way. Then, then did you go off and start exploring? All the other yeah, I did. symphonies. Yeah, and I, you know, I remember when I finally got all nine on uh, CD at that time. It was a big deal. And then throughout the course of the next several years, I tried to see them all, which I have done, except for Das Lied von der Erde and the tenth. Well, that's about all the time that we have for this uh, episode of Toledo Symphony Lab. We want to let you know that this program is generously underwritten by a gift from the estate of Barbara Garwood and is a production of WGDE Public Media in collaboration with our sponsor, the Toledo Symphony. You can download episodes of this program as a podcast by going to our website at wgte.org slash lab or by subscribing on Apple Podcasts. You can also find us on Google Play. My thanks to Zach Vasser, Merman Sue, and Felicia Canny. I'm Brad Cresswell, and this has been Toledo Symphony Lab on FM 91.